Hi, I'm Peter Afrasiabi. The program you're about to watch, Appellate Oral Arguments in the Age of Zoom, or Don't Flush a Toilet, tips from the technology trenches. It was recorded a few years ago, but I've confirmed that the content is still current and reflects the present state of the law on this topic. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions or would like more information about any of the topics I cover in the program. I hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome to Appellate Oral Arguments in the Age of COVID-19. This program is designed to give you, the advocate, some tips in terms of how you can use technology in this brave new world to better and more effectively present your case in an appellate court. Since the pandemic began a couple months ago, I've had to argue in the state and the federal appellate courts using technology for the first time as the only means of mediating myself and the court, of mediating my argument and the court's receptivity to my argument. Now, of course, it's better to stand at a podium, to be just a few feet away from your judges, to look them in the eye, to be able to read their body language, recognize where you think the argument's going and pivot to your next argument if that's the better one. All of that, however, is gone now. We're using technology. And all the judges say it's going to be like this for quite some time in light of the enduring pandemic. So, experience in the trenches has given me a lot of tips that I can now share with you in terms of things that you can do to make sure you have the most effective appellate oral argument. And I stand and deliver, right here, right now. My first tip, don't do this. You see right behind me my flags? For the last 30 seconds that I've been speaking, you may not have been listening to me. Why? You were checking out my flags, wondering, why does he have flags? What kind of a guy is he that has two flags? Is that a 48 star flag? I mean, what era is it from? World War II, 1930s, when? Why does he have a flag there with a you know, Union Jack in the corner? Does he collect flags? All these questions going through your mind about what kind of a guy I may be as to why my home office has flags in it. And you know what? If you're standing before three judges using video to make your argument, you don't want those judges thinking those types of things and getting lost down the bunny rabbit um, holes they go down pondering these questions. You want them focused on one thing and one thing only, you. So there you go. When you're doing an appellate oral argument via video, use a blank background. That's the first tip. There's going to be a lot more like that. So let's get started. Where are we going today? The big goal here, of course, is oral argument and getting you ready in this brave new world of technology-based appellate oral arguments to have your last chance at persuasion for your case. Oral argument is always critical because this is your final opportunity to use your persuasive techniques and your skill set to convince the appellate panel that you should win your case. We're looking at both telephonic and video technology, of course. We're also gonna review the oral argument role and purpose in our system in terms of where and how oral arguments are done and done effectively looking at them specifically through the prism of now technology-based ones. Similarly, we're gonna look at preparing for appellate oral arguments with a specific and particular focus on technology-based appellate oral arguments. We're gonna talk about mooting, something that I believe should be done in all cases, especially now in this technology environment where you do technology-based moot court practice sessions to work out some of the kinks in technology. Ultimately, we'll look at all the different technology issues that are critical and that can affect the quality and power of your presentation to the appellate court. We'll talk about a whole series of do's and don'ts to have an effective technology-mediated appellate oral argument. But of course, we are going to start where you don't want to end up, being flushed down the toilet. And of course, I'm referring to the flush in time that embarrassed the nine, the famous case that I'm sure you heard about in May 2020 now, where in the first week of Supreme Court appellate oral arguments that were being broadcast live for the first time, during the oral argument of one of the advocates, we all heard the toilet flush. You don't want to do that. So let's, let's walk through this case a little bit. So one of the lawyers was arguing via telephone to the U.S. Supreme Court. And during his argument, we all heard a toilet flush. Now, we don't know who flushed the toilet. The jury's out. I bet there's some you know odds makers laying bets on who it was. But it could have been one of the nine. It could have been an advocate. It could have been someone else who was, you know, Zoom crashing even theoretically, I guess, if they were hacked, although I doubt it. But here, let's take a listen right now to a clip from the actual oral argument where you can hear the infamous toilet flush. 
place that, that the subject matter of the call might range beyond the collection of government back debt. Maybe they're going to be marketing some other product. Maybe they're going to be saying, hey, call your congressman and uh, change these laws that apply to banks. And what the FCC has said is that when the subject matter of the call ranges to the topic, then the call is transformed. And it's, it's yeah. a call that would been a... You just can't make this stuff up, can you? But there you have it. And I think what comes from this exercise are two very, very important rules. The first, clearly driven by technology, use the mute button on your phone. So for those of you who are not talking, i.e. everyone other than the advocate at the podium, you really should put your phone on mute because you don't want anyone to hear you typing away on the keyboard if maybe that's how you take notes. Maybe you're whispering to a colleague. Heaven forbid, you're flushing a toilet. Mute is critical in a technology world, and it's very, very, very easy to forget. So check, double check, triple check. Make sure you're on mute when you're not up to bat. The second flip side rule that's really important here is staying cool under pressure. I actually think that advocate did a fantastic job of not missing a beat. The toilet flushed. It was bizarre. It was ridiculous. He could have made all manner of jokes and said something and detracted, and then the court may have weighed in. Who knows, right? You could have had a funny little sideshow discussion that we may all have in, you know, regular conversation. But he would have burned off his clock and lost time. Instead, he ignored it, acted like it wasn't there, barreled ahead, stayed focused, made his argument. That's an example of staying cool under pressure where you have to be ready for a curveball. You got to be ready for curveballs when you're standing at the podium in court and you may get any kind of a question out of left field. But you've also got to be ready for curveballs in the technology world where there may be technology curves that hit you. Let's move along now. One of the massive things that you should remember about appellate oral arguments, if you go to 30,000 feet, for example, is that this is your last real effort at persuasion. You've written your briefs. You've done all the work in the trial court. You've got your record made. You've gone on appeal and written your briefs. You've made your arguments. You've countered the other side's arguments. You've used all of those persuasive writing techniques that you've mastered in your career to write and prepare the best written record possible. This, however, is your last chance at persuasion for the panel. And this persuasion involves oral advocacy, which requires a whole process of narrowing and focusing what you're going to talk about. And we'll talk about this in a little while. But one of the places to start, I think, is this quote from Chief Justice Rehnquist. Let's read it. Lawyers often ask me whether oral argument really makes a difference. Often the question is asked with an undertone of skepticism, if not cynicism, intimating that the judges really have made up their minds before they ever come to the bench, and oral argument is pretty much a formality. Speaking for myself, I think it does make a difference. In a significant minority of cases in which I have heard oral argument, I have left the bench feeling differently about a case than I did when I came to the bench. The change is seldom a full 180 degree swing, and I find it is most likely to occur in cases involving areas of law with which I am least familiar, end quote. This is a really, really important point from Chief Justice Rehnquist talking about oral argument. The key takeaway from this is that you can shift an outcome in a case with your oral advocacy. It's possible and it can be done and it happens, even if not a majority of the time or most of the time, it happens in, as he said, a significant minority of the time. That means your efforts at the podium and now via technology can make the difference between winning and losing. This is your last shot. You got to take it seriously. I want to talk a little bit right now about the history of oral arguments in our legal culture and in our historical legal culture, going back to our ancients. There you see in the top right-hand corner is a photograph of a bust of Cicero. Cicero, as you know, was really one of the greatest historical figures from the ancient world in terms of representing the finest of oral advocacy, of being an orator, a lawyer. And there you have it, Marcus Tullius Cicero. Now, Cicero, of course, is praised for his success in those Roman trial courts, given his legal skills at the time. And of course, we don't practice law the same way today that the ancients practiced law. And given this massive disparity, of course, between the Roman world and modern America in this early 21st century, we have to recognize that 
we're not looking to emulate Cicero. But the reason I have Cicero here is that certain aspects to what Cicero taught, what he spoke about, and the lessons that he wrote down at the time, which, which lessons survive to this day for us to read, really do have direct relevance now, literally 2,000 years later. So here we have some of the really fundamental core rules from Cicero, and I call them Cicero rules. This is from De Oratore, written two millennia ago, and there's a lot of really great modern works that analyze it. If you want to have a little sidebar here, you could jump on Google and you could check out a lot of really, really, frankly, cool things that have been written, taking apart um, Cicero's work in terms of the law and advocacy and rhetoric and pon contemplating and pondering how they work in our modern world. But here are some of the really fundamental oral argument precepts that are very, very important today, which really trace back to Cicero. Cicero spoke heavily about word choice and arrangement of words. Now, this is really, really important all the time, as we know for us as lawyers, but it's particularly important in appellate oral arguments where you have a very, very limited clock, a very limited amount of time, where you have to distill all those briefs you've written into something narrow, focused, simple, understandable, coherent, you know, for, for your best argument. And you don't want to detract the panel and sidetrack them by perhaps triggering them with words that were poorly chosen. Here, you know, when I teach my appellate litigation clinic with my students, one of the things I really work hard with my students to have them do as I get re them ready for arguing the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals every year is to be very, very careful and focus on certain words, such as the words clearly or outrageous or disingenuous. These are sort of some of the trigger words that can upset courts and get a court to leap in, interrupt you, detract you, to really ask, you know, is it really clearly the case or, you know, disingenuous, you're accusing them. And you get wrapped up, obviously, into these, you know, twisted pretzels that are unnecessary to your case. And so word choice and arrangement is something that's really, really important. It's been practiced from the time of the ancients. It's practiced today. And really with telephonic oral arguments, it becomes even more important because you've lost your body language and your gesticulating as a means of communicating with the panel. So all you really have now are your words. Related to that is delivery, the pronunciation of your words, the inflection that you can now use in terms of taking your voice and recognizing you, that your voice alone, even independent of your body moving with it as you, you know, speak to the court, even slightly animated at the podium, your voice is a tool. You want clarity in your enunciation. You need to make sure you're always speaking in relevant terms. And Cicero spoke a lot about speech and knowledge. And I think one way of contemplating what he spoke about was that they are both critical. They were sort of two sides to a coin. You can't have one without the other. And another way of saying that is that one should think before they speak. Have knowledge in your mind before you speak. Don't just speak without thinking because you may utter something that is foolish, that's unnecessary, and that will set a panel off and make you get dragged off somewhere you don't want to go. These ancient lessons really are always important in our practice as lawyers, I think. But I think in this technology mediating the argument world, they're now more important than ever. So let's fast forward in time to the history of oral arguments in the United States. And just briefly, until 1931, the Supreme Court had oral arguments that lasted literally days. And lawyers would come and they would speak for, you know, all day and they'd come back the next day. And it was sort of an endless argument, so to speak, um, you know, to the court with the court asking questions. But in 1931 or so, the U.S. Supreme Court shifted and said, no, we're going to 30 minutes. And as you now fast forward, you know, almost 100 years and we're now in the 21st century, the reality today is that most appellate courts give you at most 10, maybe 15 minutes if you're lucky for most cases. Sometimes you get 20 or 30 if it's a very complex case or a complex um, trial appeal, for example. But really, most appeals you take up, you have 10 to 15 minutes, and you should count on having 10 minutes to, to make your case. Overall, we'll look at some data in a little while. 23% of all federal appeals have oral arguments. So not only is oral argument shrinking in time, it's shrinking in quantity of cases that get argued because it's becoming more and more a rarefied experience. As we turn now to the next slide, this is Federal Rule of Appellate Procedure 34, which governs, of course, in all the 
circuit courts in the United States. And this is the rule that governs when and how we have oral argument. And so here's the general governing standard from Federal Rule Appellate Procedure 34. Oral argument must be allowed in every case unless a panel of three judges who have examined the briefs and record unanimously agrees that the oral argument is unnecessary for any of the following reasons. The appeal is frivolous, the dispositive issue or issues have been authoritatively decided, or the facts and legal arguments are adequately presented in the briefs and record and the decisional process would not be significantly aided by oral argument. That's the governing standard. And what it means is that in the federal courts, at least, you do not get oral argument in every single appeal. Panels of judges settle upon one or all of those factors to justify dispensing with oral argument in many, many cases. Indeed, by and large, the majority of cases. And we'll look at some data shortly to see. So when you do have oral argument, in my experience, at least, having done hundreds of appeals now, I've taught a clinic with law students for 20 years to get them ready for the Ninth Circuit in terms of their oral arguments. I've been an appellate advocate for, for two decades in my private practice also. My experience has shown me that when you have oral argument, it tends to be cases that are more sort of ones that you could say hang in the balance, where your efforts as an advocate could actually make a difference. So. It's really critical, therefore, to be ready and be prepared for when you do have your oral argument. One thing we should note, though, is, for example, in California, on the flip side, when we're in the state appellate courts, you absolutely have the right to oral argument unless the advocates, you know, the parties decide um, through their counsel that they don't want it. So it's the opposite rule to the federal rule. And on the state side, therefore, you're guaranteed oral argument and you tell the court how much time you need. And the courts are actually very, very generous in giving you time. If you ask for 20 or 30 minutes, I'll put you down on the 20 or 30 minute request. Here is where it becomes very, very important as an advocate to recognize how much time do you really need for your case. It's the rarest of cases that can't really be explained in 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. So you want to be careful asking for undue amounts of time. And as a practice pointer, I'll tell you one thing I've noticed. The parties that ask for the most time always find themselves last on the calendar. And so when you show up, for example, having driven from LA to San Diego for an oral argument at 1.30 and you're thinking, you know, what time am I going to be done? How's traffic going to be getting back to LA? If you put down you want 30 or 40 minutes, you can be sure that you're going to be the last people up and you may as well be spending the night at a hotel that night because you're never going to get through traffic. So think carefully about your time clock when you have the option of um, picking your time, unlike the federal side where you're given a certain amount of time. So here on the next side, you can see from the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers, the reasons offered for the fundamental importance of oral arguments in appeals. One reason is that it improves the accuracy and quality of decision-making in terms of the decision-making process, and it refines results. Second important reason is it teaches lawyers how judges decide cases. Third one is, fundamentally, it provides parties with public manifestation that they've had their day in court, the idea that the court is there to hear and care about your dispute and you as a citizen of the country get a fair hearing in a public court where you actually get heard. And this sort of ties into the fourth, which is the civics function of government and courts operating openly and fully for the people. I actually firmly believe in oral arguments, and I think they're massively, massively important. And I think part of what you know, underlies these reasons given. And if you peel the onion back to this, what you get is the capacity for oral argument to distill and synthesize all of the complex issues in a brief down to their root issue, the narrowest issue that may be in there, the narrowest method by which the court may resolve the case. You know, what is the really core, core error that's on the table, the pivot point for the case? And that can have a massive impact in terms of turning a case that maybe you are losing into a winning case. Or even if you're not going to ultimately win, for example, if you're the appellant and you still are going to lose your appeal, you may be able to lose in a different way. And that can have profound consequences for your client, depending upon the nature of how the, the, you know, the order may ultimately get narrowed in a way that may have massive financial importance to your client. It may have massive... In, you know, injunctive relief type benefit to your client. Your client may be a 
repeat player where even losing this case but losing in a certain way may be of great importance to avoid future litigation in future cases. And those types of twists and turns that can happen in an appeal, they happen in many, many appeals. Even if you don't flip the bench such that, you know, as just Chief Justice Rehnquist gave in the, in the beginning of our presentation, you know, a significant minority, maybe you get some outcome, you know, alteration, say it's 20%. But even if you're not in that 20% camp, you can be in the camp of, you know, not getting the reversal you want as an appellant, but getting an alteration in the decision in a way that has profound value to your client and import for the future. And in that sense, it's a win that you got to take home the way we as lawyers have to judge wins for our clients. So I think appellate oral arguments are critical. They're massively important. They give you an advocate the real chance to change things. And I think the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers are dead on here when they give these reasons for why oral argument is important and should be considered. So as we move to the next slide, we can actually look at some data on this. Here I've thrown up on the slide for you some data that comes from the federal government in terms of the percentage of oral arguments in cases decided on the merits by the U.S. Courts of Appeals. This data is as of 2014, and it's by circuit and case category, but it's really very fascinating if you look at it. It's broken out really remarkably well. What you can see is across all circuits, 23% of cases um, have oral argument where the cases are ultimately decided on the merits. And then you've got a further breakdown in terms of you know, subject matter category. So you know, across all circuits, 22% of criminal cases decided on the merits get oral argument. Um, prisoner civil rights are down there at you know, um, 46%. US civil cases, 38 Private prisoner type cases, 7%. Agency, 18%. So you see the numbers are all over the map. Um, it's a fascinating chart to study and look at. You can go by circuit. And you can see a great variance, frankly, between the circuits in terms of which circuit um, holds more oral arguments. You look there at the DC circuit and across all cases, they tend to hear oral argument 55% of the time. You go down to the fourth circuit, you know, it's 11% of the time. Um, the seventh circuit's 45% of the time and the third circuit's 12% of the time. And the numbers vary between all the circuits on there, as you can see. So this is really, really useful data to look at because it kind of gives you a sense, depending upon what circuit you're in, you know, and what subject matter you're confronting in your case, what are the actual percentage chances that you're going to get oral argument? And again, what's important here as a tip and a practice pointer is if you're lucky enough in your federal case that the panel says, yes, we want to hold oral argument, then I think you've got over, in some sense, one of the most important hurdles because you're in now the boxing ring and you have a chance of winning this case. The odds may still be stacked against you depending upon, you know, the, the law and the facts in your case, but you have a chance, you've got a real fighting chance. And that's why oral argument in a case where you have a fighting chance is everything. And as we turn now to the next slide, you can see I say it's everything, not just based on my experience, which has shown me that, but this is actually based on some data too. You can see here some data from the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers from their report. You can get it on the internet. This is from page four. From all their surveys, they found that 10 to 20% of judges said that their views changed based on oral argument and they didn't know ahead of time which cases that would be. This is a massively important causation type fact for us as advocates to be aware of because it shows you can change, change oral argument in terms of the outcome of a case, what may happen in the disposition. And ahead of time, the panels don't necessarily know. So there is no fait accompli for your case, in other words. That is the massive significance that you as an advocate have to take because it means you can use this last chance at persuasion you have, which really is genuinely non-frivolous, you can use it as a real chance to turn a case. And when I say this is your last chance of persuasion, let's be realistic. It was fun in the beginning to put up the Supreme Court toilet flush case, right, in terms of a case before the Supreme Court, but they only take 70 or 80 cases a year. So if you're arguing in a federal appellate court or a state appellate court for your client, for all practical purposes, this is it. This is the last chance. This is the last stand. And that's why this is the top gun of what we do as lawyers. You have to do the best job humanly possible and take every edge you can get to take every percentage in your favor and push it. That's why it's so important as we now are in this new world of technology to focus heavily on how you can make sure technology works for you and not against you. So now on the next slide, 
let's start narrowing our funnel a little bit and let's start focusing on oral arguments in an empty court. There you see a photograph of an empty court. It's the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. And what, you know, some of the basics that you want to keep in mind and remember are that, of course, you have a three judge panel. Here's a little footnote that I've noticed before. If you're not familiar with the court you're in, state court, federal court, make sure you know the vernacular used. And what I mean by that is, are you talking to a judge or a justice? Different courts go by, you know, versus state versus federal, that is, have different um, uses of the term judge or justice depending upon um, the appellate level. The federal system, of course, calling the circuit court judges judges. In any event, that aside, you're going to get 10 to 15 minutes like we were talking about of argument per side. And here's the thing. In all, in all oral arguments, those cases that actually get deemed worthy of oral argument, there's something to talk about most of the time. So you gen, generally get detailed questioning, often aggressive, but definitely focused, detailed questioning, pushing you on the boundaries of your argument. And here's what I'll tell you, having attended now multiple sessions of COVID-19 technology-based oral arguments, the one thing I've noticed is that, and this is anecdotal, but I've also spoken to other appellate lawyers who've said the same thing. In fact, I've been on appellate programs listening to a variety of different appellate lawyers indicate the same thing. And that is, anecdotally at least, there's somewhat less questioning now. And I think part of it may be a function of the fact that the absence of that physical proximity means the indicators that we use in body language to you know, silence someone. For example, if the judge wants you to pause because they have a question, they may raise their finger or look up and take off their glasses. There's all this sort of body language that we always use that communicates and telegraphs a lot of important, useful information to know to pause to take a question. And that's much harder with the phone. So that may cause, to some extent, there to be slightly less questioning. The other aspect to, I th to why I think perhaps there's, at least anecdotally it appears, some less questioning occurring is because the sheer use of the technology is new and complicated and you know you can get these awkward exchanges as you all know when you've been on phone calls and you know one person starts interrupting someone the other person stops and waits the, the interrupter stops and waits and you have these long awkward pregnant pauses where no one wants to jump in and sometimes they get really long because everyone's thinking the same thing obviously which is I'm going to hold back and wait to make sure the other person speaks. And if you're all thinking that, you then get a few seconds of silence and then everyone gives up and jumps in at the same time, right? We've all been there. We've all done that. In order to avoid that, that may be part of the trigger for why there are, anecdotal at least in my, in my experience, on the state side, less questions than there are when I'm in live oral arguments in state court. On the federal side, I will say I haven't noticed that. I think it's, it's running, in, you know, for the case I argued this way and for the, the panels I've watched um, other lawyers take cases. It struck me that the questioning was not particularly different to how it is when, when we do this live. So what we need to remember also as we get ready to get on the phone or to get on our Zoom or our video conference with the court is not lose track of your audience. Who's your audience? What are they doing? What are their goals? What's the role of this appellate court? First thing you've got to remember the audience is well-versed in your case facts and the law. That means you don't need to waste time quoting to them the statute at issue or starting at the beginning like you do in your brief. You should assume that everyone has shown up to this gunfight armed, loaded, and ready to fight. No need to warm up in that sense. The law is known by everyone, as are the facts. And so you need to then take, take that and use that to arm yourself to make the most effective presentation, which enables you really to start at the core root error that happened below if you're the appellant to explain why this court should reverse because what happened below was wrong. Your audience, of course, as you're getting ready to make that narrow, um, that narrow telephonic pitch is focused on making law for a jurisdiction. And this is massively important, of course, because it gets to the the difference in the in the systemic roles between the appellate courts and the trial courts. The trial courts, of course, are the courts where facts are made and found and developed and created. And they bind only the two parties to the making of those facts in the dispute before the trial court. The Court of Appeals is on the other end of the spectrum from the fact end, and it's on the law end of the spectrum. And it's not particularly concerned with any given fact pattern between two people other than to illuminate what the law is for an entire jurisdiction, which may be 
you know, a small state. It could be, you know, the Ninth Circuit, which has 35, 40 million people in it, for example. And so this means the lens by which the court is always focused on the appeal before them is whether there was prejudicial error below. Error is important, but it also must be prejudicial error. And that is a massively important focus, which helps you then as an advocate know when you're getting up to your video conference or your telephone, that you can parachute in on what the exact error was below that this court needs to remedy. Now, within that, they're of course using the critical tools from the toolbox of um, appellate courts, which is beyond the scope of this program. You can find other programs I've done on this, but that is, you know, in, in nutshell form, the standards of review, which go to the amount of deference that is owing to the lower court decision, which varies depending upon the nature of the decision being reviewed, i.e. factual determinations below get given great deference within the rubric of clear error or substantial evidence type standards of review, and legal determinations get given no deference within the rubric of de novo review because it's for the court of appeals to say what the law is and it's not bound by what a trial court may say the law is. And so all of these headwinds are at work for you in every appeal and when you're getting onto the telephone or the video, these headwinds are no different. Nothing's changed because of COVID-19 in terms of these headwinds. But what I do think it means as we start exploring the technology stuff is that you need to be all the more ready to have the narrowest, most concise argument with the right words being used, the least amount of words, no trigger words, precisely because you have such limited time and no ability to lose any of that time with an errant word and a big mistake. And that, of course, takes us to the massive, massive issue for you as an advocate, because you don't have your presence in the courtroom, whatever that presence may be, to stand there before the judges and use your body language to help illuminate your voice and argue forcefully for your position. All you have is your telephonic presence, your audio, your, your voice pitch. And if you're lucky, a video, if it's working well for them to see you in your home, remember... Don't put your photographs on the wall behind you to get them distracted by what a cute dog you have or you know how cute your kids are and all that. And so this comes to the central issue of credibility. And credibility is everything. It's everything in the trial court and it's everything in the appellate court. Now, what I mean by that is take the trial court, for example, where you have all sorts of different theories. You throw out every cause of action under the sun. You want something to stick to get before a jury. You often have alternative theories and you have all sorts of different things being argued. And that's sometimes okay in the trial court. A lot of trial lawyers may disagree and tell you otherwise, but that is often how things are done. Now, in the court of appeal, you have to be uber careful about this. You should only be pressing a few issues on appeal to begin with. But by the time you get to your telephone or your Zoom conference with the court to do your oral argument, this process of funneling, narrowing as I call it, you have to have funneled your appeal down to its core. This is to maintain credibility. Your briefs may have raised all sorts of issues. You may have asserted three, four different errors. They may all be legitimate, good arguments to press. Some maybe you knew you were pushing the boundaries and you were hoping to get the right panel of judges who maybe would latch onto your argument. Maybe you got them, maybe you didn't. And that means as you get up to oral argument, you now have to take your briefs, which had defined a record, a smaller record than the trial court record. You'd already narrowed in. Now you got to go narrower still. You got to get really, really tight and focused on this. What is the core error that you could win? If you had five, 10 minutes in an elevator to pitch someone on your business, what would be your pitch for why that's a good business? It's the same thing here. What is your pitch for at root, at core, fundamentally, why this appellate panel should reverse? Now, this whole funneling process on appeal is part of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about credibility. Look at this quote that you see on the screen here. It's really a critical quote from former Supreme Court Justice um, Jackson in the 1950s, and let's read it. Legal contentions, like the currency, depreciate through overissue. The mind of an appellate judge is habitually receptive to the suggestion that a lower court committed an error. But receptiveness declines as the number of assigned errors increases. Multiplicity hints at a lack of confidence. Multiplying assignments of error will dilute and weaken a good case and will not save a bad one. This is a cardinal principle of appellate advocacy, and it's critical for oral arguments to 
adopt and take this principle and apply it to actually what you're going to talk about in the scant few minutes you have. All the more important in an era of technology where it's harder to know and be able to read the body language of the judges to know if the argument train you're on is the right one or the wrong one. All the more important then that you adopt this narrowing process, adopt what Justice Jackson said, do not assign too many arguments to your oral argument time, focus in on the core that you can win on. Let's move along. Now you're there on the phone or on the video and you need to make an effective argument. Here are three pointers. Grab attention quickly before you are interrupted. Quickly explain why you win. And third, be ready for less questions than normal, even a no question panel. For the first time in 20 years of doing appeals, over hundreds of appeals, I actually had a panel that asked no questions and it was on a telephonic oral argument after the coronavirus in the midst of all of this. So you have to be ready for it and be ready to make your pitch and know to say your argument and nothing more and then be ready to sit down and submit if that's where you are. Don't fill the void of time with your words just because you have the time. That's an easy rookie mistake where you can then end up saying something that's unnecessary and you trip over yourself and you create problems. So let's start in the beginning here. What do I mean on the first one by grabbing attention quickly before you're interrupted? Try this for example. Good morning and may it please the court. Peter Afrasiabi on behalf of ABC Corp. This court should reverse the district court's copyright summary judgment to the defendant on the basis that there was no originality in the artwork. It was a legal error to conclude that this artwork lacked originality as a matter of law, and the court clearly erred factually when it concluded that this piece of art was actually a utilitarian device. Something like that, right? In 30 seconds, I went to the very, very core root of an argument and issue. I don't even know what I'm talking about because I've never had that case. You didn't either, but it could be an issue in a case that you could tee up in an appeal. And you, the listener, in those 20, 30 seconds, you knew exactly what the issue was that was being litigated. Is this piece of art that the district court said is not art and is a utilitarian object? Is that right or is that wrong under the law and factually? That's the core narrow issue. There could be all sorts of other things in that case, but that's how you begin. And that is an effective way to start, especially on the phone or over video, where you have such limited time and bandwidth to, to communicate with you know, body language and you're risking questions. There's awkward pauses. All of these issues that we've been talking about and are talking about get to the core point immediately. That's how you do it. As we now start getting into the tips on how to do effective telephonic and video oral arguments, we need to first pause to look at what are the losses? What's this delta that we now confront? And the losses are, as you see here on the slide, we lose the visual clues and cues that we used to have when we would see judges during oral argument and we could gauge their perceptions of our strengths or weaknesses on our points. And that's a really valuable, valuable thing to have at oral argument because we as advocates can really often pick up on whether the judges are satisfied with an answer by looking them straight in the eye or whether they just are skeptical of your argument. That has great value. That's now really been lost. Even with video, you can't discern in the same way because of the, the distance to the camera of each person really what is going on. And you also will find some lag sometimes in the time, even in the communication. So that's one of the big losses that we now have to figure out how to make up the best we can by doing things differently in other ways. This dovetails into, you know, whether we see them processing our arguments and interacting with each other, especially when it's not your turn and you get to watch them maybe interact with each other and sort of, you can tell that, ah, oh, yeah, two of them aren't buying that, you know, my advocate, my opposing advocate's argument. And that's now taken out of the equation and you lose that as a data point to interpret and bounce off of in terms of what you do. So this give and take, this loss, these are the important loss, losses that we now confront um, but the flip side is we get to do this from our own physical space that we can now define and set up however we want. And so, you know, one of you may say, isn't this great? I can just do less to prepare. I can lay everything out, set it up just as I want to do it. I can set it up, you know, you know, all over the, you know, multiple tabletops and have computers and laptops and screens all in front of me. Can I do that? And here's where we need to take a pause and say, you can, you may even want to do all that stuff but don't prepare differently and don't do less because this could cause real problems for you. Why is my advice here to be careful? My advice to be careful is that real-time multitasking in a dynamic oral argument doesn't easily facilitate having 
endless numbers of paper and screens and um, poster boards and everything around you that you can suddenly rifle to and look at. And while those things are very useful to use as a crutch, and you certainly can have them up there to make a very fast recall if you need, if you don't prepare as if you didn't have them, then when you find yourself in a sticky situation, you will be lost looking for the right paper and then trying to read it to answer the question. So you still should prepare in that fluid, natural way so that it's just you, the podium, your brain, and the, and the panel. Um, that said, having all of these things is great. And so laying stuff out just as a crutch, just in case, can certainly be beneficial. So here are some tips that you want to do when you're doing this. Again, don't skip on learning your record as if you're standing in open court. Learn your record. Don't skip on learning the law just because you could put all the case law in front of you and you could go grab a case on the fly. You still need to know the case. You won't have the ability to read and um, synthesize some case law you know, in the, in the fast speed of oral argument. Um, the fact that you can set up everything, even have people around you to help, is an alternative useful crutch to preparation for sure. But consider all the ambient noise that you may create with this physical setup, both from other people moving around, creaking in chairs if they're there, even laying out papers on the table. If you're going to lay out papers on the table, put a towel down and put the papers on the towel. Because you'll find as you rifle through paper on a desktop, the scratchy noise that's made can really be picked up loudly by the microphone. And that's a real issue that you don't want to deal with. Some of the upside to, to this setup is that your podium type materials that you may have made before where you had just a summary of some facts and law that you would want to look at in, you know, in an emergency, you can really set up in a larger way now um, on bigger boards that can be useful. You can have them right there next to you and you may or may not need them. In my first one of these I did in the state court, I set up a whole conference room with big boards on facts and case law and record citations. I had all my notes and everything that I could possibly consider record materials. I had an iPad laptop open. I had a regular um, laptop open. I mean, you name it, it was all there. But it, ultimately, I didn't use any of it. But it was nice to have it if I'd been in a pinch. And so I think having those things can be beneficial if you're in a pinch. It certainly gives you a greater degree of comfort than not having them. So in that sense, you can have them, but do not rely entirely on them. Prepare again as if you were there in person. Location, location, location. It's everything. Now that you will be on a phone or on a computer video system and you're not in your office, you may be at home. So here are the things you gotta think about. Do you have a home office? Are you going to do it in your home office? Is the lighting set up properly if you're on video? Are you gonna do it in your bedroom? Maybe in your kitchen, a work office. You can still go into your work office sometimes. I have for my oral argument, I was the only one in the building, but I went in to do it because I was sufficiently concerned about all the ambient noise and my inability to control the noise here at my home. Maybe a quiet garage is the place you do it. But here, you have to consider everything. This is where the details really, really matter because here we are in an appellate oral argument. This is the top gun of persuasion and advocacy. There's no margin for error. You don't want to hang up your panel and lose them because of some errant noise that was unnecessary. So think about all of this very, very carefully. Some of the ambient noise things that you should really think about are, are there dogs barking? Is it trash day? Is it the day your gardener is coming? Or do you have kids running around? Is your son, like my son, driving a car where he put a loud muffler on it? And I could be worried that at that time of day, he may drive home with this really loud car on the street that's gonna be creating noise that everyone will hear. These are all the different things. I mean, is it the Amazon delivery guy showing up that's gonna cause the dog to bark? Um, then you've got to also think about your personal gadgets and things around you. You know, house alarms, phone alarms, is the oven cooking along waiting for a timer to go off? Um, your family phones, all of those things. And here's the third kicker, because I spent a lot of time thinking about all this to get ready for my oral argument, and I thought I had covered every single base on noise. Cell phone was turned off. Um, I'd gone into my office. I made sure no one else was in the office, even though I was in the office alone on my whole, you know, floor you know, with 20 odd offices, I was the only person in and all the doors were locked. I still put a sticker on my door saying, on a call, do not knock or make any noise, just in case someone showed up. But even then, I forgot about one detail. And it's the next button you see there on this slide, Siri or Alexa. So here's what happened. I was setting up my iPad, laptop, um, 
it was on, it was open to my record materials, one particular record page that I really thought was going to be central that we'd want to talk about. And I wanted just to have it right there with me. And I took my watch, my Apple watch that I wear, and I had it on the timer so that I could keep track of my time because this is one of the issues. You don't have a timer on the state side. The, the Ninth Circuit will have an electronic timer on the video, but on the audio, you don't have a timer. You need to watch your own clock and be in control of it. So I figured, great, I've got this Apple watch. I'll set the timer to count back from 10 and I'll just keep my eye on it. What I didn't think about was in the middle of all of this, as you're sitting there talking, every once in a while, Siri pops up for me. It just popped up in this video, actually. I noticed as I was filming it when I said her name. But sometimes she pops up and says something even when I haven't asked for it. It's just there's something about a way I said something or something I said that triggered her and she starts babbling along saying something. That actually happened during my oral argument and it was confusing and befuddling and I had to make sure I shut it down and turned it off so that I could keep going with my argument seamlessly. So if you are in this point where you are now taking care of everything and you've thought of all the gadgets, you're even using your Apple Watch to count backwards, don't forget that Alexa or Siri person may well get triggered and so then you've got another technology issue to think about. So turn them off. Okay, so let's now focus on you. The first issue is, do you stand or do you sit for your telephonic oral argument? The answer, in my opinion, is you stand. Stand, I say stand. And I put it in with some exclamation points there because I really do believe in this. Let me talk to you a little bit about why. On standing, think about the reason that you don't see many really great singers who sing as great as they normally sing when they're sitting. In fact, most singers hit the best notes when they're standing. And I think that's because sitting tends to restrict the airway. It prevents one from getting their voice out as smoothly as they want. And if you just do it yourself and really pay attention to your voice, you'll notice the difference in your voice and your physical body when you're talking while standing versus talking while sitting. There are muscles being used, there's posture and relaxation differences in your body, and there's really more open space in your chest, I think, with the organs less compressed around the lungs. Anyway, that's my science pitch for it. I do think there's some science behind this that's been talked about in the space of singing. Whether it's been peer-reviewed or double-blind studied, I don't know, and certainly I don't think it's been done in the law space, obviously. But I actually, from experience, firmly do think that it's true. So I think there's good reason to stand even though you don't have to stand while you talk on the phone because no one will see and no one will know. And so you should stand. Now, there's a second aspect to standing that I think is important. And that is that all of us as advocates, we are all used to going into court, whether it's in trial courts or the court of appeals. And almost all the time when we address the court and we make an argument about a motion, we stand and we stand at the podium or the lectern or at council table and you make your pitch, you make your argument. And we are, as advocates are used to doing that standing up. That's just the way we've always done it. And so I think there is some familiarity and usefulness to continuing on with that. Even if you're in your, your home office, in your kitchen, even if you're in your garage, wherever you may be doing it, try to recreate as much as possible the nature of how it is that we do these arguments. And so standing is definitely part of it, I think, that's really useful. And part of the reason standing ties into the voice, this is how I bridge these two issues in my own mind, is that as we stand and we talk to the court, we regularly gesticulate with our arms or hands. Not wildly, of course, but a little bit here, a little bit there for emphasis to make a point. That, of course, is lost in the appellate oral argument when you're doing it over the phone. And it's not lost as much to um, in the same sense over video, although it is a little bit, of course. But you as an advocate, you as a speaker, you are used to using your arms in conjunction with that tool of yours, your voice, to make certain points. And so continuing to do that helps you in terms of moving your arm to the right and inflecting your voice up, as I may have just done. Or on the other hand, your honor, opening your palms and lowering your voice a bit, right? The combination of the two going hand in hand is how you've been trained and what you do. And so I think there's good reason to keep doing it. What do you wear? Really? You can wear anything you want. You can go totally casual beach Hakuna Matata style in your t-shirt, your hat, your shorts. It's all good when you're on the phone. For video, of course, you want to wear your suit. Now, although it's funny we make a joke and there I am in my social distortion t-shirt and my beach hat, let me be clear. 
I didn't actually go to oral argument that way. Let me tell you why. The last several weeks, at least, I've been in t-shirt and shorts almost every day. And this was my first time going to court, so to speak, in a long time. And part of the act of being a lawyer and going to court, we're service professionals. We armor up in our suits to show up for our mediation, our appellate oral argument, our big deal or negotiation, if that's what you do as a transactional lawyer. And there was something to me about attending wearing, I didn't put on a suit to go do a telephonic oral argument, but I put on my slacks and a shirt and I sort of armored up and the the physical changes in terms of what I was wearing also produced in me a greater level of seriousness, a mental shift, just a change from the status quo, the norm as things have been. And that was part of the reason also I actually went into my office, even though I was all alone in my office to do it there because I felt it just brings me mentally and psychologically in every which way into a more professional environment that I'm used to and I'm able to then perform as a service professional. So I'd advocate, you know, even if you're doing it over the telephone, put on some proper clothes. Don't just be in your flip-flops and hat. Um, Take it seriously. Armor up. Finally, we spoke about the background on the video that you may want to have if you're doing an oral argument by video. I talked about it in the introduction, and I really stand by it. One of the things that's been fascinating for those of you who've used Zoom historically, but especially in this context as we're all using it now more and more, is the background to someone's home is it's fascinating. It's interesting. Everyone's kind of curious and you see the paintings on the wall, the pictures here, the, you know, the artwork, whatnot. You don't want your audience to be distracted by that. And I can tell you as an advocate watching the judges, I thought it was really interesting when I saw, I was arguing before Judge Schroeder on the Ninth Circuit. She had a really beautiful um, photograph um, art on her wall. And I thought, wow, she has incredible taste. You know, we all get distracted by that. And these are things that you don't want to distract your audience Um, when they're listening to you speak. You want to be the center of their universe as you speak and make your argument for your client. So I highly recommend going to a completely neutral background. Don't let anyone peer into your life and into your um, proclivities and tastes. The next issue, of course, is what technology do you use? Do you use your cell phone or do you use a landline? Do you use a speakerphone or receiver? Do you use a headset? Here's my best advice, having tried this different times in different ways, both with the courts, but also in moot practice course beforehand. My best advice is to use a landline, non-cell phone if possible, and to definitely use a headset. You may have noticed that during this presentation, I've got a little earpiece in my ear. It's a headset, basically. It enables me to speak clearer and make sure that you can hear me clearer in terms of the content that I'm speaking. It reduces, in other words, the natural echoes that occur in rooms and that may occur over an awkward bridge line if that's what's being used by the court and that can sometimes occur in distortions over the technology. So my best advice to you is to definitely use a headset of some kind and try to use a landline as much as possible because cell phones have their own issues, as you know, spotty coverage, endless ringing other calls, um, text messages pinging your phone. If you are going to use a cell phone, remember to turn all of those off. Now, The video technology being used by the courts varies greatly. The California Supreme Court has its own video system and interface that you can plug into and use. The Ninth Circuit's offering both audio or video, depending upon what you may want. When the COVID-19 struck and the court started shifting immediately to this um, technology version of oral arguments, the DC Circuit was using only audio. Michigan and Texas Supreme Courts were using Zoom, and I think everyone has become familiar with Zoom now. This brings us to an easy one. Go to the court's websites, call the court, find out how they use technology so you know what to do. And you know what else? You can test your equipment beforehand. The courts have been fantastic. All the personnel have been really helpful and they will work with you sometimes days ahead of the call I found with the Ninth Circuit to test my phone, test my system, make sure there was no echo, make sure I got the speaker, um, I mean the volume button on the phone set at the right level for the court. They will do it on the day of oral argument even. I mean, it was a fascinating process to sit there as they worked with the counsel to make sure all the counsel sounded right. They worked with each of the individual judges to make sure they sounded correctly so that the technology would work in the most effective way possible. That is something that's available to you. Avail yourself of it. It's really important. With respect to mooting, it's really important 
to do several of them over the phone or whatever technology you'll be using. Get your law partners, get your friends, get a spouse, a friend, anyone. Get someone though to do it with you because you'd be surprised at the number of glitches and issues that you can pick up when you practice. For example, if you know the court's going to be using Zoom, do a Zoom call so you can understand if you perhaps have a bandwidth problem in your home on Zoom and so it creates an echo or a weird noise. Or maybe there's something about your internet line that's different to the work internet line. This is why doing rehearsals like that, we call them soft moots, are obviously very important because you want to make sure the technology is not a hindrance to you being the most effective advocate you can be. Now, you should also do a substantive moots. I'm a firm, firm believer in moots for a variety of reasons, as well as teaching, of course, an appellate litigation clinic with my students. I moot them heavily to prepare them for their Ninth Circuit oral arguments. One of the moots I always have my students do, I have them do it early in the process and again later in the process, is a presentation of their oral argument where they get no questions from a panel. The panel's silent. Now, why do I do this? Because it's always possible that a panel may not ask you any questions. Interestingly enough, in my entire career, as I mentioned earlier, the first time it personally happened to me in dozens of oral arguments, in hundreds of appeals, supervising many, many, many more dozens of arguments with my students there, the first time it ever happened to me was in this technology era of the COVID-19. And I was arguing a case to the state court, and in my preparation, as I do always, I prepare my argument without any questions so that I know if I happen by chance to be struck by lightning and never get a question, what are the core points I want to make? What's my core argument? What do I have to get out of my mouth to win my case without having to fill all my time? If I can do it in, if you're being given 10 minutes and I can say everything I need to say in five and do it in five, then I do it in five. I don't fill that time. That, that need to fill time is a dangerous, dangerous thing, I think, for an appellate advocate. If you've made your points, then you should be comfortable to submit and save the balance of your time for rebuttal and just call it a day. Filling time for the sake of filling time because you have it while it's the natural inclination of us as lawyers. We love to speak, right? That's our natural inclination. It's a very dangerous game um, for, for an appellate moot court. And so when I was arguing my um, state court one over the phone here just several weeks ago, it turned out I didn't get a single question and I prepared for that and it was fine. And I made my argument. I had time left. So be it. That is exactly what you should always do, and you should be especially prepared for it in this environment because anecdotally, as I mentioned earlier myself, other lawyers have noticed, people are doing this more and more. Judges are asking less and less questions on the state side, it feels like, so you may well get a panel like this. Know your case, say what you have to say, sit down. This brings us to our last two slides. The first one is do's and don'ts that you should be using in all appellate arguments in all times. And the second slide I'll get to are specific do's and don'ts in the age of COVID-19. Let's take the first slide, do's and don'ts for appellate oral arguments in all times, including these technology times. Answer directly. Know exactly what you want your court to hold. When a question has been answered, pivot back to your point or segue to a new point. Look for the narrowest basis to win. Focus your argument through the standard of review prism and relevant law. Maintain your credibility. Listen to the question and let the judge finish before answering. Stop talking when interrupted by the court. Let's pause here. Very important point. And it's very easy on a telephone to not properly manage the call and interrupt people. Know your argument. And if you're done, like I talked about, reserve your time and submit. Don't fill the void just for the sake of talking. Too easy to do. Now, let's move to the next slide and look at the do's and the don'ts in the age of COVID-19 specific to this program today. Do's, turn off all noise sources. Consider your location very, very carefully. Remember what I talked about earlier. There could be ambient noise coming from dogs and neighbors and kids and cars. It could be delivery people. It could be alarms in the house of all sorts and kinds. Think about that very, very carefully and just go through your day a few days beforehand and pick up on all the different ambient noise sources that you're dealing with. Those are things you want to make sure you avoid and what you do to turn them off. The other key do, it's where we started. Mute when you're not on the call. Another important do, pause after major points a bit longer than normal. This ties into speaking a bit slower and enunciating a little bit more. You remember what we talked about in the beginning with Cicero in terms of clarity, pronunciation, enunciation? 
It's all the more important on a telephone because often body language can tell the listener what you're saying and where you're going in an open courtroom and words travel in the way they do in the normal environments. But on the phone, no one can see you, no one can read you, no one can understand necessarily where you're going. And so it's a bit important to speak a bit slower and enunciate just a little bit more. The other do, talked about it a lot, stand. I'm doing it right now. The other one that's important is to stop talking the moment you hear a question. Now, here that means you have to be listening very, very, very carefully to make sure that you can hear that question. So listen carefully. The moment you hear a judge talking, stop talking. It's important in all contexts. It's all the more important now so you don't end up getting stuck in one of those awkward situations and burning off your clock. If you're going to lay out papers and set up stuff all around you, put down towels so that if you are peeling through the papers and lifting them up, the ambient noise created by the paper rubbing on the surface is reduced. Have a clock running. Make it a silent clock. You don't want to run into my Siri problem. Remember that one. So make sure your clock ticks backwards silently and make sure when it gets to the end, it doesn't send, up, send off an alarm for you. You need to use extra vigilance in listening for a judge's voice. This ties into stop talking the moment you hear a question. The way you do this is you listen carefully for the judge to speak and while you're speaking, do not listen to yourself exclusively. This is something that's really important. You can train yourself. But one of the habits of being on the phone often is that as we are speaking, we're in command of the speech and we just keep going. And it's way too easy to speak over someone else who tries to chime in. Here, it's not an irritating interloper chiming in. It's a judge. You need to stop instantly. So while speaking and making your arguments and your points, listen very carefully to yourself and to the, to the phone to make sure you can hear a judge. Did I mention standing? I think I did. Make sure you stand. And finally, use the toilet beforehand, people. Come on. Don't try to get away with it, or you may find yourself with your case being flushed away. Thank you very much for listening today to this program on appellate do's and don'ts for telephonic and video oral arguments in the age of COVID-19. I hope you, your families, your loved ones are all safe. Keep coming back because we're producing more of these programs to help you continue this wonderful profession that we're in, the practice of law in the technology age as we deal with all these new events. Thank you.